afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Olgun Akpulut. I'm a human rights and constitutional scholar based here in Istanbul. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of the Human Rights Academy of Frederick Norman Foundation Turkey, I would like to share a warm welcome to all of you uh, from a sunny spring uh, day in Istanbul. Um, before focusing on our topic today, uh, just a short note to say that this event is being uh, recorded and is going to be uh, broadcasted at social media channels of the foundation. Our topic today is COVID-19 and women. COVID-19 is certainly a health crisis, but it has massive economic and social consequences for women. It's worsening the women's already disadvantaged position in the labor market. It's increasing the burden of unpaid domestic and care work, and it's leading to different forms of gender-based violence due to home isolation. It's expected that women will be among the most vulnerable groups worldwide in terms of the jobs uh, be lost as a result of COVID-19. And moreover, uh, some groups of women are particularly vulnerable, such as those working in healthcare and daycare systems. Uh, because women make up around 70% of healthcare workers globally, 80% of the nurses in most regions in the world, and 70% of the daycare workers, which means they are in a close contact with sick patients or high-risk groups. To discuss all of these issues, I'm delighted that our distinguished speaker, Professor Yakun Erturk, is accompanying us today. Yakun Erturk is a professor emeritus of sociology. Her half a century long career focused mainly on women's studies worldwide. Just to name a few of her many positions and functions, she served as the director of the United Nations International Research and Training Institute for the Advancement of Women. She served as the director of the Division for the Advancement of Women, again at UN headquarters in New York. She served as UN Special Rapporteur for Violence Against Women. And she also served uh, as the member of the Co Council of Europe Committee Against Torture. She also took part in various national and international agencies on rural development and women in development projects. She's a human rights and feminist activist with her own terms, uh, a senior citizen, and perhaps above all, a thoughtful human being who puts her heart into everything she does. So I'm extremely pleased and honored that I was given a chance to moderate her talk this afternoon. So without further ado, I would like to give Professor Arthur the floor. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I think, Hojam, you have already sort of summarized my uh, presentation this evening. Uh, you have certainly uh, uh, emphasized some of the major points, but let me start with sort of uh, the uh, 2020 coronavirus epidemic in general. Uh, a year has passed since it has been uh, declared uh, as a, a major health hazard. And I think we know more about it today than we did uh, a year ago. And I think most uh, analysts uh, agree that this virus uh, was not unexpected, but rather ignored by states who favored political choices that has dismantled the state capacity for social well being and care in the course of four decades of neoliberal hegemony. The pandemic is said to have led to the sharpest and deepest economic contraction in the history of capitalism. Just to use a very popular phrase, which some of you are very well aware of, all that was solid has melted into air. Hard borders returned, globalization went in reverse, production and consumption outlets collapsed, trade and travel declined, neoliberal denunciation of fiscal austerity and limitation of public spending vanished, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the world in one year has really uh, tumbled to something uh, quite different. Uh, COVID-19 has not only proven that private driven uh, market economy has been destructive of the planet, the health system, agriculture, uh, public services, but that it is simply unsustainable. 
uh, it cannot, life cannot go on in the post COVID era as it has been before. The consequences uh, for lives, livelihoods, and human rights have been certainly profound. And it has been magnified all existing inequalities that we uh, are familiar with. And some of these have already been discussed in the context of this uh, program, such as refugees, minorities, and human rights system at, at, at large. Um, women, the subject of our discussion today, of course, uh, are known to have assumed the blunt of the uh, brunt of the impact of the virus with long term implications for gender equality and women's human rights, for which we have been struggling for years and years to come. Much has been written on the matter, and it has been reported that women are disproportionately affected by the adverse impacts of the COVID. And some of these uh, are, uh, I will just count a few, women are overrepresented in overall job losses and unemployment. 70% of essential health professionals are women working at the front line with risks to themselves and to their families. Women shoulder the bulk of both paid and unpaid care work. Distance education, which left millions of children out of uh, the educational system, particularly burdens uh, the future of the girl child as it holds the risk of early marriage and child labor. Physical distance and stay home measures have made the home a nightmare for many women. Forms and scale of violence escalated globally during the lockouts. Promotion of repressive measures by patriarchal and authoritarian politics, which became more entrenched during this period, targeted rights of women and LGBT persons, including sexual and reproductive rights. Turkey's withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention with a presidential decision is illustrative of what I mean by repressive uh, practices and policies. And unfortunately, uh, Istanbul Convention has been uh, a matter of debate, uh, not only in Turkey, but in many other Council of Europe member countries. And it looks like Poland may be next in line in the initiative to withdraw. Civic closure, physical distance practices, and diminishing funding constrained women's rights organizations and their ability to respond to um, victims of violence. But at the same time, uh, we have to remember that nothing is uh, one dimensional, unilinear, that change is often very dialectical. Despite the fact that women's organizations have been constrained, uh, they have successfully mobilized and expanded their outreach uh, through the internet. And this is something that uh, has contributed uh, in a very positive manner on how the negativities of uh, the current crisis can be turned into uh, an opportunity. But by and large, the situation is quite gloomy for women and other disadvantaged groups. The UN Secretary General responded that the COVID-19 would reverse the limited progress that has been made on gender equality and women's uh, rights issues. And this is ge generally uh, a fear that many women's organizations also hold. Well, let me start with a, uh, asking a, a very uh, concrete question. What makes women as a social category so universally distinct and uniquely vulnerable to the current crisis. Can the multifaceted impact of the COVID-19 on women be explained as one of disproportionality as it is often reported? Or is it, in other words, is it a matter of numbers that more women in this, more women in that? Or is the problem more complex than meets the eye? Well, my own, uh, position on this is that the differential gendered impacts of micro policies adopted by governments in response to the virus 
are systemic and structural in nature. The prominent, predominant patriarchal division of labor based on sex universally designates women to care as caregivers and men as breadwinners. In today's webinar, I will reflect on how this structural inequality has made women's situation precarious, more precarious during this uh, crisis. And in so doing, I will focus on employment and care outcomes of the pandemic and argue that the lockdown has exploded into a care crisis. Care has been in crisis long before the current uh, pandemic, no doubt, but its effective seizure of the global economy unseen before has placed politics of care on the agenda of even the most uncompromisingly right-wing liberal administrators. With the lockdowns, productive and reproductive activities merged and concentrated in the home, making the private sphere a collision zone for multiple forms of work, exposing the irreconcilability of demands on the modern family, which had to be absorbed largely by women. So the private sphere, which has sort of been in the shadows and unseen, has become the primary focal point under the impact of the crisis. Reproductive work is actually money for capital and constitutes a huge slice of economic activity. At the, however, it has been excluded from measures such as GDP and largely overlooked by liberal feminists inquiry as well as uh, policymakers. Women's unpaid labor, reproductive labor, is the source of their subordination to patriarchal power and is critical for subsidizing the economy at no cost. This is what makes the so-called holy family uh, rhetoric uh, or debate uh, so uh, common. Uh, all those uh, anti-woman, women's rights uh, opposers make their, uh, argue their ground on the basis that by woman gaining rights, the family will disappear. Well, it's not so much the family, but the very centrality of woman's unpaid uh, labor that is, uh, that is at stake here. Uh, professions stereotyped as feminine, um, per, uh, performed largely by women, serve to draw on wage, uh, no, low wage and flexible labor. So the indispensability of women's unequal uh, or rather unpaid care labor for the maintenance of the status quo has been on the agenda of feminist theorizing uh, who have launched wage for housework campaigns that began uh, in Italy in 1972. Since then, time use surveys measuring unpaid labor contributed to some uh, positive policy measures that improved women's situation. In our um, legal reforms where we adopted uh, a new property regime, this is quite reflective because now uh, under the new law, when women are uh, seeking divorce, even if they had not monetarily contributed to the family assets, their unpaid work is recognized. This is something that is no doubt very important. However, care uh, in itself remained to be undervalued or uh, unvalued. Silvia Federici, warned 30 years ago that dangers of devaluing care work would eventually materialize into a crisis too big to ignore. The disruption of public life in an unprecedented manner under 2020 coronavirus pandemic has finally made this reality impossible to ignore. In other words, what feminist activism couldn't realize for nearly half a century, the pandemic achieved 
in an instant. Today's crisis is not only a health crisis, but also a crisis of capitalism and patriarchy. As a result of the social transformations and women's rights movements over the past decades, the maintenance of the male breadwinner model has undergone considerable change. Women in all parts of the world integrated into the workplace in increasing numbers. Gender balance and employment and in, uh, and in, uh, in employment and in decision-making positions became a policy goal and measure of women's empowerment and advancement. For example, women's participation in the labor force and their share of national income are primary indicators used by gender empowerment and gender development indices developed by the UNDP. And many of us use these in indices in showing uh, whether women have made progress in a given country or not. Uh, the advance, uh, to advance women's participation uh, in the mainstream public institutions, UN General Assembly in 1997 adopted what many of you know, are very familiar with, a gender mainstreaming uh, policy. Now, today, gender mainstreaming is adopted by international and national institutions, as well as civil society actors. Now, whether gender mainstreaming is a viable uh, strategy to achieve gender equality is a matter of another debate. But I think by the uh, tone of my discussion this evening, you, uh, it will become clear that uh, the, gen the mainstream needs to be reorganized. Uh, for middle class and affluent women, uh, mainstreaming into uh, the workplace uh, to mainstream society uh, meant outsourcing their care and household responsibilities to less advantaged women, paid domestic workers or female members of the family, such as grandmothers, uh, etc. So this uh, was possible through a direct exploitation relationship among women themselves. Women of disadvantaged classes had for long been recruited into the factory as cheap labor, forming uh, somewhat of a reserve labor force. So um, care work remained uh, largely intact while the provider model enlarged to include more women in it. So we changed the provider model to accommodate for women's participation uh, without necessarily changing its basic structure, but the issue of ch care itself remained in the shadows of the private sphere. So the cri current crisis actually disrupted this whole system. On-site activities of education and commercial uh, sectors moved to the home and eroded the demarcation of traditional boundaries such as public, private, uh, domestic, professional, paid, unpaid labor, which are all associated with the male breadwinner model. So this model has come to under stress at the, uh, under the uh, conditions of COVID. What has replaced it is confinement as a new divider. So today we're not talking about public private space as such, but confinement which is determined by whether jobs could be uh, performed remotely or not, and by the shift of care work to the home. Uh, <coughs> in some countries, uh, confinement uh, led to other uh, dichotomies, such as in Turkey, uh, senior citizens were uh, subjected to compulsory confinement uh, and this has caused much distress in this country and much debate. There are still many court cases pending and some of these cases may make their way to the European Court of Human Rights uh, if they are not resolved uh, satisfactorily in domestic courts uh, in the post COVID era. Uh, so this, this has been quite uh, a moment 
as middle-class professional woman, uh, after years of successful privileged experience in mainstream public life, all of a sudden found themselves once more confined to the home as primary uh, providers of care and housework. Affect this affected not a handful of women at all, but even those who thought they were immune. This was a shocking revelation. Many of us uh, asked the question whether uh, advances of the past decades were simply illusionary, that we really didn't go through uh, change in the first place. So understanding this dilemma, this unprecedented crisis is now a major issue on the agenda of feminists as well as uh, mainstream uh, research and policy making. So the current re recession is, has very specific employment effects uh, on women. Uh, it is said to be uh, unusual and distinctly different in its employment effects compared to previous uh, economic downturns. Past recessions were either what was called man sessions or affected men and women more or less equally. Male dominated uh, industries such as uh, manufacturing and construction, which are paid better and are, have better work conditions, are closely tied to economic cycles. Whereas leisure, hospitality, service sectors dominated by women are normally less cyclical. So the current uh, crisis has hit these less cyclical uh, jobs more so than uh, the, the jobs that are held by um, normally by men. And so some analysts have referred to the concept of C-session, C-session, um, recession, C-session. So we're inventing new terminology as new realities uh, hit our consciousness. The actual gendered employment effects of the pandemic is no doubt intersectional, hitting women of color and working class women uh, or those in the informal sector more severely. However, on the whole, uh, women's jobs are 1.8 times more vulnerable to the current crisis than uh, men's jobs. Unemployment levels uh, uh, of women vary across countries, social groups, and the lo lockdown cycle. However, at its peak in 2020, on the average, women's unemployment rose by 2.2 percentage points, more than that of men's unemployment. Women make up 39% of the global employment but they account for 54% of the overall job losses. Women in the informal sector, particularly those who are engaged in uh, domestic labor, labor in private homes, are probably the most deprived and invisible group. Uh, it is estimated that on the average, 60% of domestic workers globally lost their livelihood with the lockdowns but they were not able to benefit from any governmental support packages because they are largely undocumented. And this is an issue, uh, the feminist uh, uh, scholarship is also uh, keen on, but yet uh, an issue that has not been sufficiently uh, interrogated. Employment effects of COVID-19 on women are not just limited to those who lost their jobs, but also those who were about to enter the labor market for the first time. Since the start of the pandemic, as the uh, market economy slowed down substantially, paid and unpaid care economy intensified, uh, pro proving that care work to be inflexible non-deferrable and urgent. I mean, think of an earthquake. You can defer your daily activities, but children have to be fed, they have to be taken care of, 
uh, and daily life has to be sustained. Well, economic crisis similarly, while under uh, COVID-19 deferring many activities, some work being transferred to the home through, tele, uh, through the internet or uh, some activities totally postponed, uh, but care work simply had to be done it is, because it is inflexible, non-deferrable and urgent. While women in general absorb the increased burden workload of those who remained in employment, uh, single mothers with small children and women in disadvantaged econo economic classes became particularly uh, demanding. Unpaid work accounts for 16.4 billion hours a day. Three quarters are performed by women. According to ILO, this is equivalent to 2 billion jobs. So in other words, if women stopped doing their care responsibilities, 2 billion jobs would have to be created so that care uh, is provided. Paid care work, uh, the, some of the uh, care responsibilities are transferred to the market or to the public sector and is, uh, is, pay, is waged. This work is 11.5% of global employment and of the 380 billion workers, two thirds are women. So it is obviously clear that care work, which we all depend on, is predominantly carried out by women. Whether, whether voluntarily or uh, out of uh, no other um, options. Well, basically because of the sexual division of labor that I have referred to. So it is a historical and structural phenomena and not uh, a coincidence that there is such a heavy burden on women when it comes to performing paid and unpaid uh, care labor. Uh, one on a positive ground, however, studies show that men working remotely from home have also contributed to the increases uh, in unpaid care work. For example, some of you may be familiar with the nationwide survey conducted in Turkey by feminist economist İpek İlkaracan. The survey shows that men's unpaid work time went up nearly five fold during the pandemic. Uh, however, despite the fact that this has increased, women are doing more than four times as much of the domestic work uh, as men even now. According to the same study, paid and unpaid work combined, women's work increased from 7.7 .7 hours per day pre-pandemic to nine Point two hours during the lockdown. Almost 80% of this increase was due to unpaid work. Today, daily work hours of women who continued to be employed as essential workers went up to more than 10 hours per day. Now, similar trends are found in other countries because of the commonality of the sexual division of labor that I refer to. Although globally more men than women have telecommutable jobs estimated at 28 and 22% respectively, male share of domestic labor remains considerably behind that of women. So this is sort of the picture of how things have transpired uh, during the COVID-19. Uh, uh, current pa pandemic has confirmed that paid and unpaid care labor is essential for human survival, without which families, societies, and economies would fall apart. COVID-19 transformed the domestic sphere into a site of multiple forms of production 
and limitless exploitation on a scale uh, unseen in the post-agrarian societies. In other words, this, the current configuration resembles very much the agrarian uh, structure. If the, the, the more the domestic sphere is isolated uh, from the outside world and activities are performed within uh, the domestic sphere, we are uh, tending towards a more uh, agrarian type of society. Historically, the burden of social services like health care, child care, elderly care, etc., on the eco economy has always been eased by women's unpaid work. So when a given activity uh, in the market, care activity in the market, uh, is infringing on profits, and is becoming a burden on the state, it, is, it has been tended to be transferred, shifted to the household to be picked up by unpaid uh, women's uh, labor. However, women are no longer willing to absorb capitalism's shocks and be content with the prescribed roles of caregivers. This is evidenced by years of women's rights struggles and the more recent wave of feminist strikes from Argentina to Turkey, to Poland, to United States, and you name it. The conservative populist backlash on women's rights and the repressive state policies concerning women and LGBTQ persons are merely efforts to restore, not the family, but the destabilization of patriarchal masculinity. Patriarchy and capitalism, therefore, are facing their most manifest challenge under COVID-19 conditions, putting the civilized, and I use quotations there, civilized world at a crossroad. This reminds us of what Frederick Engels once said, According to quote, bourgeois society stands at the crossroads, either transitioning to socialism or regression into barbarism. Of course, Engels uh, did not have the same perspective in identifying care as being the major contradiction for his uh, paradigm. Uh, working class uh, contradictions were uh, predominant. Uh, now, I, I think we have broadened that understanding to show how care intervenes into the class structure. So today we face a choice similar to what Engels foresaw a generation ago. The collapse of neoliberalized public health sector, education, and other critical services, unsustainability of capital intensive urbanization with large plazas and long distances where people rely on transportation to get from their homes to their work. Uh, declining agriculture, which in this country has been very acute, a country that has traditionally been termed as the breadbasket of the world, today imports most of its essential uh, food products. Uh, similarly, the cl uh, climate change, which is uh, causing alarm across the globe, and many other problems that uh, we commonly experience globally, pose today an urgent call for addressing the care crisis once and for all. For all. Care can no longer be perceived as a private concern and an exclusive preoccupation of the essentialized female. Sexual division of labor needs to be transformed by placing the caregiver model as the organizing principle of the state and economy. This means transforming how we organize work through cooperatives, community-based service uh, solutions, reclamation of space for 
people-friendly cities, and many other uh, strategies. Care, we have to emphasize, is not a commodity that can be commercialized in the neoliberal market. It is an ethical value, um, and it can be an antidote to carelessness towards people and the planet. Change is inevitable given the contradictions and incompatibilities that have surfaced uh, during the uh, current pandemic. There seem to be two likely scenarios as far as I can see. One, affirmative politics in recognition of human interdependence to one another and to the natural environment that promotes collective welfare over profit or reactionary and isolationist responses that reinforce authoritarian, controlling, racist, misogynist patterns of governance, taking us back to conditions reminiscent of the Cold War uh, era. I can identify three main factors that can tilt the balance. One, government policy and action for recovery that is guided by not profits and particular interests, but by science, by knowledge. And this is something I think in Turkey we are very sensitive about because uh, this has been sort of a contested area in how our government has dealt with the pandemic. But it is absolutely essential that we put knowledge at the center of our uh, action and policies. Second, investing in social policies and public sector production of essentials so that we do not leave this to the mercy of the market, which, is, uh, which tends towards profit. And finally, internationalism to foster international cooperation and multilateral policy and action to address common interrelated problems, which is more uh, acute today than ever before. We cannot simply afford to go back to a new form of isolationism uh, that, was, that prevailed during uh, the, uh, the Cold War era. In short, what I have tried to convey today uh, is best expressed by the motto of the COVID-19 crisis, and that is being in, uh, being in this together, being in this together. This motto may, in fact, become part of an affirmative politics which would take us through structural and systematic inequalities and collectively bring us on an alternative path for a long lasting transformation of both the domestic and the public spheres. I shall stop there and perhaps we can uh, have a discussion on your contributions or any issues that um, I left unclear. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your thoughts. That was brainstorming. In fact, we got a lot of questions from oh. the audience. Um, as a lawyer, maybe I could pick the legal one. And okay. Start with, yeah. And it goes as the following. Um, do international norms established post-World War II era provide sufficient guarantee to protect women during the pandemic? I think that's kind of an evaluation of the whole post-Second World War human rights system in general and its response uh, to rights of the women under violation today? Well, uh, of course, uh, in the course of the past three, four decades, uh, particularly since 1990s, when violence against women, uh, something that was always regarded as a private matter, became officially acknowledged at the Vienna Conference on Human Rights, we really uh, quickly expanded on an international regime that is quite comprehensive. I mean, we have the CEDAW Convention, we have uh, uh, Istanbul Convention, which is a regional uh, mechanism, and many other mechanisms, which in my opinion, 
are quite sufficient in protecting women's rights. However, the problem is to what extent is their will to implement these? I mean, the very withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention is a, a scandal in this regard, if you ask me. I mean, it, it carries the name of our beloved uh, city and Turkey was, Turkey uh, both in terms of government and civil society played an incredible role in uh, the drafting and the adoption of the Istanbul Convention and was the first country. But we see that the, uh, the enthusiasm uh, for human rights that existed in the 1990s, which really helped us to prosper in this respect, has diminished with uh, particularly after, uh, well, I think the sort of the turning point can be uh, the uh, attack on the Twin Towers in New York, where national security began to override over human rights. So today's problem is not lack of laws and uh, uh, agreements and documents uh, for promoting and protecting rights, but it is uh, the in unwillingness uh, of states to uh, honor these rights, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions about Istanbul Convention, but I will turn back to them later. And the other question is about um, the possible working model after COVID-19. Uh, it, it refers to flexible and remote working conditions. And would it uh, reach us to a state that, you know, a greater engagement on men in care work? And would it solve the problem of current uh, gender inequality? Well, this is certainly something that's being discussed and many people, uh, observers argue that business are so aware of the problem of care uh, that has come about uh, that uh, they may adopt uh, flexible work patterns similar to what's happening now in the post-Cold War era. This is also uh, economically efficient from a cost effectiveness point of view. So I think we can easily expect that there will be more flexible work arrangements and work from home type of arrangements. And the technology is also very much inclined towards taking us in that direction. And uh, certainly this kind of an uh, environment can help families working, especially heterosexual couples to meet their, the needs uh, to balance their uh, uh, professional and care responsibilities. Uh, and this in the long run will definitely have an impact on norms. I mean, uh, masculinity today is not what it used to be for a lot of men just 30 years ago. Some are still trying to hold on to it without any uh, much uh, hope, I, I think. Um, bad news for them. Uh, so yes, uh, lifestyles uh, and so forth does have an impact on norms. However, and also let me just in parenthesis talk about uh, um, parental leave mm -hmm. uh, policies that many countries have adopted, not maternal leaves, not paternal leaves, but parental to enable both the father and the mother to take time off uh, when, they, when there's a new baby. Uh, and these are important. They, they do have an impact on how we see our femininity and masculinity. And uh, in the long run, uh, will uh, definitely uh, bring about new norms. However, I don't think that this will change the structural uh, division of labor where care is assigned to, uh, to be a private matter. Care is not the problem of men and women uh, sharing work so that they can take care of this. It is a societal problem. Care has to be the organizing principle of the economy and the state. And this is a growing movement now. There is a, a new book. Uh, a, it's not so much of a new book, but it's recently been translated to Turkey, Care Manifesto. I have it right here. It has been translated to Turkish by Gülnur Savran, for those of you who are interested. But I think you should read this book, not, not be confined to this book only, but read 
uh, on other similar analysis, which has a heavily feminist uh, perspectives, because I think the two will complement one another. So to answer your question, it's good, but it's not enough. Okay, there's also another kind of a follow-up question about the care. Uh, it says, um, I mean, given the deeply rooted uh, current model, how realistic is the notion of universal care? And how would such a world look like? And uh, it also asks uh, whether there has been a comparable uh, period in the history for such a model. Well, before the COVID, I would probably say that it's a long range struggle to come. I mean, for 30 years, I talked about 70s when uh, Italian feminists started the movement, the campaign, uh, wages for housework. It did, some work did happen in that area, but it didn't revolutionize the way we live. It has, uh, neoliberalism has been very strong and very rooted, but COVID has really uh, produced conditions that erupted this system. The system itself, even if we wanted to, cannot last any longer uh, with great efficiency. Capitalism in general uh, is a cycle of crisis. Uh, and up, up till now, it has been possible to overcome these. And one of the main factors that enabled this recovery has always been uh, women's unpaid labor. But this has come to an end. Women are, uh, are not willing uh, uh, and, and are, I think our democratic and human rights values also contradict with this, even if women were willing. So uh, today, I think this has become more of a reality, uh, more of a possible reality for me. And I, I'm thinking of the post two world, second world war and the great depression, which had uh, in its own uh, sense, a very prominent impact on uh, crumbling the pre-existing system. And it was as a result of uh, the D Great Depression and the destruction of the uh, Second World War that uh, welfare state emerged. Uh, and women's integration into the uh, labor market also uh, was very much stimulated under the conditions of the post uh, two World War II period. So what reality history shows us is that times of conflict are times of confusion, but also times for imagining and revisioning a new world order. And I think we need to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's another question about migrant women. Um, how COVID-19 has an impact on uh, women migrants? How did the major political actors such as governments, international organizations respond to the needs of migrant women during the pandemic? Well, this, has, uh, this was a problem that was uh, discussed even before the COVID, as you know, and I think your last webinar uh, was yeah. on refugees. So uh, you probably discussed uh, more concrete mm -hmm. aspects of this problem than what I can offer. But let me just say that uh, in our country in particular, uh, the influx of Syrian uh, refugees was in such numbers that a country like Turkey, which used to be known as sending refugees, saying, sending migrants, all of a sudden found itself to be a receiver. Mm -hmm. And in such large numbers, I mean, five, five million Syrians across the board. I was on the uh, Syria uh, Commission of Inquiry for its first six months, uh, which was created under the Human Rights Council in 2011. And uh, during my work as commissioner of, uh, on Syria, I visited some of the camps in uh, Turkey, uh, in, in uh, Hatay, as well as uh, in Jordan. And my other colleagues went to the camps in um, Lebanon. Uh, but the conditions there were quite con contained and the needs of the um, refugees, whether men or women, were being uh, addressed by the Turkish government and other governments. But the problem, the scale of the problem uh, became so large that today uh, 
it's an unsolved problem. Syria has become an unsolved problem. And these refugees, and I, of course, we shouldn't only think about Syrian refugees. There are refugees, millions of refugees uh, throughout the world, mainly in developing countries. Uh, one of the uh, most striking uh, aspects of refugee status for women is the incredible uh, violence that they face. And uh, this has been uh, sort of a issue that has always been the main uh, discussion when we talk about uh, refugees. Uh, now in Turkey, uh, there are many studies now done and uh, Syrian women and other refugee groups are organizing and working in coordination with Turkish women's groups, which has been a positive development. Uh, I'm not too familiar with uh, the actual situation on the ground. I haven't been working on, the, uh, on this issue, but what I said earlier in my presentation that uh, the women's organization's ability to respond to issues like violence, refugee rights, and so forth has been curtailed uh, under uh, the impact of the COVID. So I, it is my guess that many of the positive work that was being done previously has really come to a an halt. And even national Turkish women have uh, difficulty in reaching services. So I can imagine that refugee women are even burdened further. But I think we will know more on the actual situation once research and information starts coming out as we go along. Okay, thank you so much. Well, we have around 10 questions oh. uh, about the same issue. Okay. And the issue buried in those questions is the following, the increased domestic violence and how to respond to that during the pandemic. We have around 10 questions about the same issue. in here. That's a million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. Uh, you know, stay at home has created a perfect opportunity mm -hmm. for domestic violence. Uh, it brings together people in crowded households. I mean, it's easy to say, stay home, but not everybody lives in mansions or even more modest uh, apartments like we do, where uh, we have enough space to sort of hide ourselves. But uh, most households are overcrowded. Secondly, a lot of men who lost their jobs are frustrated, cannot bring bread to the household. This is not an excuse, but it has always been a reason why men took it out on women and children. And uh, of course, uh, in the earlier periods of the COVID-19, uh, we had uh, uh, a practice that uh, freeing of prisoners, uh, which meant that those who were in prison for violence and abuse were out to carry out their business uh, behind closed doors um, with very little monitoring. So it has been a very trying uh, times. And it is because of the fact that uh, things have gotten so uh, privatized that violence levels have increased. What can be done about it? Uh, I don't think there have been very successful strategies developed, but uh, there have been some very symbolic uh, strategies. For example, in some countries, women, uh, from a window, if they cannot go out from the window or from uh, their balcony, they can use certain hand signals uh, to passers-by to attract their attention that they're uh, living under, uh, uh, under violence. This seems to have worked in some cases, but uh, it's, it's not a solution, of course. These are uh, very uh, insignificant little interventions. Uh, if states had responded to the health consequences of the pandemic uh, in a parallel way to the violence pandemic, mm -hmm. they could have injected certain uh, precautions from the very beginning. But this was totally overlooked, not only in Turkey, but globally. 
um, uh, and the repressive uh, or the right-wing movements are even encouraging this uh, further. So women's uh, unpaid labor is so precious for patriarchs, small and big, uh, at home and <laughs> outside, that uh, keeping women in their place justifies violence, unfortunately. So we're gonna pay the price uh, once the pandem pandemic is over. We, we have, uh, women have really suffered tremendously. And not to say anything about the girl child, in previous uh, um, crises like the Ebola, uh, we know that the girl, girl child was target of sexual abuse in their homes. So these, are, uh, these kinds of uh, data will start surfacing more and more. I think some, some data is already uh, published by women's organizations. That's another area in terms of uh, responding to violence that our ability to document, report and document has also diminished. And this is, uh, this is a serious problem. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> the next question is about gender sensitive measures against the ongoing peak of the pandemic. And it refers to the current measures uh, taken in Turkey, I think a day ago, uh, about sending uh, women working in the public sector back to home earlier than men uh, as a measure to combat the pandemic. And the question is about how could it be possible to develop gender sensitive measures uh, against uh, COVID instead of these one-sided measures? Well, you see, uh, the response is always protective measures, <laughs> not emancipatory measures. I mean, everybody recognizes women's vulnerability to current conditions and to conditions in general. They're, they have also, I think, uh, announced in the last uh, package the, uh, that pregnant women uh, in public service will be uh, sent home. I mean, uh, I can understand uh, this kind of protective measure for special circumstances such as pregnancy, but putting women under protection uh, is not the way to solve the problem. Uh, gender sensitive measures would need reorganizing care, the home and the public uh, workplace uh, to accommodate for the different needs. And we, we were not there yet, but I think this is what needs to be done. But sending women early, uh, I, uh, I, in our previous discussions, I've, I talked about gender mainstreaming as understood, for example, in one of my country visits as special rapporteur on violence against women, uh, Algeria to be specific. Uh, I was there during the month of Ramadan and uh, the police chief in order to impress me said, we're doing gender mainstreaming in our police headquarters. I said, oh, that's great. What are you doing? He said, we let uh, female police go home early during Ramadan so that they can cook the iftar dinner. I mean, this is how either to protect women or to put them to work, we use differential treatment. This is not gender sensitivity. This is gender differential discriminatory practice. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a follow-up question about this uh, workplace uh, conditions. Uh, it asks whether there is an organization documenting the discrimination in the workplaces during the pandemic. I, I'm not aware of any. Okay. I'm not aware, at least in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you know, uh, just before the pandemic, uh, a new ILO convention was adopted on uh, violence against women and abuse uh, in the workplace, which is uh, very important. So that uh, mandates uh, uh, authorities and civil society to document, but I'm not aware of any systematic work that has actually been done okay. in this regard. Okay, thank you. Now I will continue with uh, the questions about the Istanbul Convention. Okay. And the question is uh, why Turkey withdrew from Istanbul Convention and it's asking your personal view about it. And the follow-up question to Istanbul Convention is, uh, what should be the effective response, response to government's disengagement policies with human rights, such as leaving the Istanbul Convention? Perfect questions. Okay. Turkey withdrew from the Istanbul Convention to please 
the right uh, religious right wing for political uh, reasons, for votes, as simple as that. I think uh, no need to elaborate further. They sacrificed the Istanbul uh, Convention for the religious uh, votes, and they sacrificed the uh, HDP for the nationalist right wing votes. Uh, unfortunately, populist politics um, is very cheap in terms of uh, respect for rights. Um, of course, between what, what they have actually said was that in one announcement, I think it was um, Altun who said that uh, certain groups, LGBT groups, have uh, conceptual uh, have manipulated the convention. Yeah. Yeah. I find this a pitiful statement. A state that leaves its commitment because they think somebody is manipulating is not a state, in my opinion. And I may have somebody uh, knocking my door at six in the morning today, but by all means, they're welcome. Uh, this is a, this is a sad statement it shows that the state is not capable. And I think uh, he, Alton himself, should be questioned um, uh, in terms of this kind of statement. Um, those groups, the right-wing groups, uh, Jamaats and so forth, uh, who waged a war against the Istanbul Convention, of course, their reasoning was that it's destroying the family. And similar arguments are made by very different cultures and religious groups like Poland, Hungary, et cetera, Bulgaria. They're also arguing that the Istanbul Convention is destroying the family and the fabric of society and uh, culture and so forth. Well, one has to ask, what do you understand of the family? I think that what they mean is that it's destroying male domination in the family. It's destroying patriarchal masculine masculinity, uh, whereas protection of the family really can only be possible through observing human rights for all within the family, just like protecting national sovereignty can only be achieved not by hard borders, but by protecting and respecting rights of the citizens. And the possible response to these disengagement uh -huh. policies? Well, yes, I think that's a very good question because withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention is just one indication. Yeah. I think this has implications for the whole multilateral international human rights system at large. And there have been signs of uh, criticism of the system for some time now. Uh, US, of course, has uh, been indifferent to the Human Rights Council for many years. They have withdraw funds from uh, units, entities of the UN that they saw were not loyal to their interests. Um, during uh, Trump, during the COVID period, was very harsh in uh, criticizing the WHO uh, and so forth and so forth, climate uh, agreements and so forth. There are so many uh, withdrawals from international agreements in the past years that really endanger uh, multilateralism. I think many of these countries are disillusioned, especially the hardline uh, wealthy and powerful countries are disillusioned that human rights did not play into their interests necessarily, that it had potential for uh, wider uh, interests. And this is what is so uh, precious about human rights that we need to nourish. Uh, so going back to bilateral diplomacy uh, gives greater clout to these countries to uh, sort of push for their own interests. How do we respond to this? Well, I think we have to uh, promote internationalism uh, at every level because while we are observing localism and national level, uh, responses. Because the problems uh, that the COVID made so vivid 
are global, not not local. Yeah. They have local solutions, but they are not local problems. We're so interdependent. So we need to uh, perhaps the current a UN system and the Council of Europe, European Union, and other uh, regional and in, uh, international systems uh, are not uh, meeting the current needs. After all, many of these, the UN has been created under very different conditions. So there is, and there's always talk of UN reform. I worked within the UN itself and saw firsthand how uh, it has really become a dead body in a way, but this does not call for abandoning it. I have also seen how we, we need to rely on international institutions, we need to protect them. So I think this may be an opportunity to review these international multilateral institutions for real um, reform, to respond to the care crisis, not only at the national level, but international level as well, because the international system is also very much based on the mainstream of the workplace. And uh, we need to develop more protective uh, instruments that respond to care uh, in a very specific way. I think this will be the agenda uh, for all of us in the coming years. Mm -hmm. But we must not give up on internationalism at all mm -hmm. and Thank the you. multilateral system. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, it's about feminism. And it asks whether there has been a robust feminist response to COVID-19. Or at least, are yeah. you satisfied with that the response? Well, well uh, there have been uh, a number of responses, maybe not uh, loud enough uh, and heard by everybody. but. Feminism in general uh, is not heard by many people to begin with. But yes, women have responded. There have been collective groups uh, that have issued uh, prin feminist principles for feminism. I have a few of them. Uh, I can send them to you and you can circulate to those who are interested. Uh, the UN uh, Commission on the Status of Women uh, met in March, uh, and it meets every year, uh, every year in March for two weeks. And of course, COVID, of course, this year we had to meet, uh, it met uh, not in person, but uh, virtually. And COVID-19 crisis was a major issue that was uh, discussed uh, at that uh, meeting. So there have been feminist responses, uh, as I said, maybe not loud enough, but uh, yes, I think they have perhaps responded more so than any other group, uh, any specific groups uh, and sort of offered principles. Uh, and also there's a growing interest among feminists to engage more with uh, the left movement because socialism, um, a renewed understanding of socialism uh, is becoming more and more compatible with the interest in putting care uh, as opposed to profit at the center of uh, economy and state. So we have a lot to learn from one another. Uh, and yes, feminist voices have to become more vocal. And of course, one of the things that uh, was discussed perhaps more openly that attracted more attention was the role of uh, female leaders. Uh, it was argued that uh, leaders, and today I think there are only 22 countries with mm -hmm. female heads of states uh, out of 190, <laughs> which is, which is, uh, which shows why feminist voices are <laughs> not heard. Well, uh, many argued that women leaders have been more successful mm -hmm. in uh, responding to COVID, and they have produced some uh, sort of evidence to this. But I, I, uh, I tend to be to shy away from essentialized uh, explanations. I mean, women uh, as a species do, do not necessarily have to be better than men. Uh, but because of their common experience of being subordinated and in, uh, in places of inequality, they have a different perspective that they can bring and sensitivity. So many of these female 
uh, leaders may have uh, dealt with uh, the problems with that kind of a perspective. But the real reason behind their success is they come from countries that uh, have allowed for women leaders to flourish to begin with. And even in the, at the local level, uh, local leaders, there are many local female leaders, mayors and governors and so forth in these countries who are doing excellent uh, job under the COVID. So it's the democratic and human rights, respect for human rights principles that make a difference in leadership and opening the way for female leaders. So I think we need to uh, not romanticize issues and sort of, you know, take on uh, hooray for woman kind of uh, approaches, but see what about the current female leadership uh, accounts for their relative success, because there are there have been female leaders in the past who have been as militarist as any other male uh, mentality and as unsuccessful. Uh, we experienced a very feminine and lovely female prime minister who used a very militarist uh, language. You know, let them kill me first was a slogan she had. Uh, we don't want to kill anybody. We want to uh, create a system where we respect the li lives uh, of humanity and the planet so that we can all live and flourish. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Arthur, for being with us this evening. Thank you for your presentation, for the fruitful conversation we had. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the people working behind the scene this evening, the Academy staff member, Elif Günay Menderes and her assistant, Vatikan Erkoç, for their work in putting together everything for this evening. And thank you, our translators. And thank you for the audience for being with us. We hope to see many members of you again for future events. So stay in touch, uh, stay safe, and help others to stay safe. Uh, and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good evening.